Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. This happened back in the mid-80s. My friends and I, four and all, used to go hiking in the Cascades and Oregon quite a bit. While 99% of the hikers stick to the trails, we'd plan trips off the beaten path to discover areas few people had ever seen. We'd plan a trip, take a trail up to the general area, and then strike out towards a place we wanted to check out, sometimes a day or two out depending on how rough the terrain was. Our last trip started out normally enough. We'd made it to our launch point, spent the night, had breakfast the following day, and had broken out our Forest Service topographical maps to make our plans. This time around we hadn't decided on a destination, and were considering our options. That's the last thing we remember for nearly 24 hours. We woke up the next day, still in our clothes from the previous day, in our tents. We didn't even know a day had passed until one of my friends checked his watch, and noticed that the date wasn't right, which I confirmed with my own watch yes, even back then there were watches that kept the date. One moment we were looking over maps to see where we wanted to go, the next we woke up in our tents, all of us feeling like we were hungover. The thing is, while my friends swore they didn't remember anything, I did, if only a little. What I remember is that we were doing some hard hiking in the mountains when we heard children's voices, the sort of noise you hear at a playground. All of us were, what the effing, thinking that we'd really screwed up in our navigational skills in a way that boggled the mind, and we headed towards the noise to see just how the hell we'd gotten so far off track, and where on God's green earth we actually were. We broke out of the tree line into a clear area, where there were a number of low, squat buildings, the sort that remind you of what the U.S., Army builds spare, utilitarian, ugly, green. Surrounding the buildings I assume all the way around, but I don't know was a heavy duty chain link fence, not the normal sort, but the industrial strength kind. Towards where we were was a large blacktop, where children were running around, and where a mixed group of kids and adults were also playing a game of basketball. It was, indeed, a playground of sorts, inside of what looked like a military compound. Out in the middle of nowhere, deep in the mountains, and not on any map. I remember one of the adults looking up, then everything gradually falling silent, as the entire group of adults and kids eventually noticed the four dumbstruck hikers on the other side of the fence. And then nothing. That's it until I woke up in one of our two tents, the next day. As I said, my friends said they remembered nothing, and all they wanted to do after they realized they lost a day was get the F out of the mountains and back home. Me, I remembered, at least a little, and I was pissed because I figured we had stumbled onto something secret, and had been drugged and dumped back at our campsite for our efforts. I wanted to figure out where the hell we'd been hiking, go back, and see what there was to see, but the guys were having none of it. I tried a number of times to see if I could get any of the gang to go back up with me this time with cameras and try to figure out where we decided to hike, but the guys flat out refused any discussion of the matter, much less an actual attempt. Going by yourself into wild country is outright stupid, and I wasn't quite so pissed as to consider this a valid option, so I never went on my own. To this day I have no idea what it is that we found or why someone thought it necessary to drug us and dump us. I figured we weren't killed outright because four missing, experienced hikers would result in a newsworthy search and rescue op, especially since one of us was sort of famous, and just might make national news if they up and disappeared. I'm still pissed about it though, and would seriously like to dish out some payback to the shit stains who messed with us. Some friends and I went camping to scout some private land owned by a family of a friend in Tennessee. We camped right on some four-wheeling track, but clearly the property hadn't been touched in a very long time. 
The second day we dropped some molecules and went exploring deep in these woods. Beyond the insane amount of ticks, the hike was actually very nice. Until. We got about a mile and a half deeper in. We walked along some bare-faced rock ledges that ran along a creek. After taking a route along the creek, we stumbled into a cleared out area in the middle of the woods. The space was the first thing I noticed. It felt like it was intentionally carved out by people residing in the woods, or coming here on a regular basis. But it got weirder. We started discovering all sorts of remnants of past visitors. We looked a little deeper, and found a cast iron oven, and a couch rotting from exposure, and riddled with bullet holes. Near the couch was a road sign. A large one. The original size was probably a solid 6x8. If you've ever handled one of these road signs, you'll understand that they are not light. It would take a lot of effort to drag that out to the middle of nowhere in the woods. Now, if it was just a sign, this story would be going nowhere, but it wasn't just a road sign. The sign had been carved into the shape of a full woman, from head to toe. The rendition was completely accurate showing lots of patience and skill. But this wasn't a piece of art. Throughout the entire body and face of this metal woman's body, were holes made by both bullets, and what apparently was either an extremely large knife of an axe. Once we saw this, we got right the F out of there. This must have been around 1992. I was camping and hiking with a friend in the Lake District, and we were making our way through Borrowdale along the Derwent. It's a popular spot of the country, there's always plenty of tourists out and about. I was following my friend, and we rounded a large boulder by the river, and he stopped. We did that comedy thing of me not paying attention and bumping into him. He indicates to me to shush, and I poke my head around to see what made him stop. Stood in the middle of the river was a quote self-pleasuring man, shirt pulled up and tucked under his chin, trousers nowhere to be seen. We sniggered, shook our heads, and took a different route. He didn't see us. We ambled and dawdled further along the route, and after a snack stop, we could hear what sounded like girls squealing. We decided to investigate, and who did we see, but the creep once again with trousers around his ankles this time. Only this time he's flashing at girls on the other side of the river. Gripped by an adolescent sense of justice, we decided something must be done, but being a pair of fairly weedy nerds, we thought getting the police would be better. It was agreed my friend would jog up to the nearest road to flag down someone to call the police, and I'd remain behind to keep an eye on Mr. Wavy Penis. I skulked unseen behind a tree and kept watch. After a couple of minutes something must have unnerved the wanker, I'm assuming an infuriated parent starting to wade across the river, or something as he left the riverbank and headed straight through the woods towards where I was hiding. I was sitting in a hollow in the roots of a tree. He walked straight past me and turned to look behind him. He was only feet away. I stopped breathing. He stared through the trees for what felt like an eternity. I thought I was doomed. Then he just turned away and headed back up to the road. I followed him to the road and figured out he was headed for the nearest car park. My friend had gone that way to find someone to call the police, so we met up as he was coming back to find me, and we were able to get the registration of the van that Flashman had got into. Within a minute of him driving off, a police car arrived giving the full blues lights and squealing tires. We waved them down and they were there to respond to the call my friend had convinced someone to make to 999 for us. We gave a brief description, and the van details. The police were delighted as this guy had been doing this for years, but people would see him and run off to call the police how did we ever cope before mobiles, and he'd have disappeared by the time they arrived. We arranged to make fuller statements at the station, and started to drive back. Luckily we were parked in the same car park, and the police would follow us back to Keswick. About halfway back along the valley I checked the rearview mirror, 
and saw the police car slam on the brakes and throw on the lights. They disappeared down a track off the road. When we got to the station to make our statements, we were pulled into a side room and told to be quiet. The policeman told us they had spotted the van as we were driving back and had gone looking for him. They had found the flasher with his shirt off and flies undone prowling through the woods. Unfortunately, there were no available cells in the station's small town, so he was being held in one of the offices next to where we were. Arrangements were made to return to take part in an identity parade and to point out our man. When we did return later the police told us he had now refused to take part in an ID parade, so we were asked whether we would be prepared to be taken into the room he was being held in, look him in the eye and confirm it was the flasher. We agreed F it, it's not like we had to live there and confirm that was the guy. Full statements were given, justice was done, and we would eventually receive a lovely letter from the Cumbrian top cop thanking us for our efforts. As we left the station feeling rather exhilarated after our small adventure, Mr. Wagelnob's wife we assumed arrived. Before the doors closed fully behind us we could hear her shouting, You dirty F, you've been doing it again, haven't you? Hiking to one of my favorite spots in the Appalachian Mountains, I came across what appeared to be a recently built stone altar, with a large wooden cross situated behind it. There was a string tied to the cross that went directly over the altar, and tied to a tree across the way. Several other strings tied to trees all of which had markings freshly carved into them. There was a pentagram of rocks in the middle of all of it. There's been lots of rumors throughout the years of satanic cults, worshipping in the woods of this area. This was my first experience with it. My name is Brandon, and I live in Alabama. I'm about 14, and this story takes place in the year 2008 or 2009. I'm not really sure, I was quite young. At the time, I lived with my grandmother and grandfather, which I'm not going to say exactly why. So, we were beginning to move and doing things to renovate the yard, putting grass around the house. We had a few people helping my grandfather and grandmother, while my brother and I played around in the street and ran the house. Since it was not a very big house, but big enough for us to have a deck on it in the back, there is a small patch of woods just behind the house. So, my brother and I were just playing, and I don't know. I just felt like something was off around the woods behind us, like something was there, keeping an eye on us, watching us. I would hear sounds of leaves and branches moving. Maybe it was the wind, maybe not. Maybe 40 or 50 minutes later, we were pretty hungry and thirsty, so we ate and later went back to play. When we got back, we went to play, and about 10 minutes had passed. I totally forgot about the woods, and the sounds I had heard stopped. I stopped and just looked to see if I could see something, and I walked over there, not really close but close enough, and still nothing. It's like whatever was in there just stopped. So, I didn't want to think about it even more because I got paranoid easily and left and didn't go back over behind the house. The next day, there was only a little grass left to cover the house, and the sun was setting. I didn't remember to avoid the back of the house unless necessary. I was playing, walked behind and stood. I had a feeling something else was there with me. I turned to my right and saw this big animal or something like a werewolf or some sort of upright dog with yellow eyes looking at me, lying on the ground. I stood there for a few seconds and then ran to the front of the house telling my grandparents what I just saw. Well, neither of them believed me and told me to keep playing. So, for the rest of the time, I just sat at the front of the house, thinking that's what it was. I still don't know what it was, or if it was there at all. And before I moved there, I swear I heard things outside in the woods, and sometimes I've seen things. Things first started really taking off around 2010. See. 
My best friend lives on the outskirts of a small nearby community, which is only about 10 miles away as the crow flies. There's a lot of heavy brush and forestation. It's all primarily secluded private property. The nearest neighbor is roughly one fourth mile away in both directions. One night, my best friend's girlfriend had just left his house from spending the evening with him. They were having a picnic outside in his front yard together. When he had thrown an apple out in his front yard, he had taken one bite, tasted that it was too sour for him, and threw it. The next morning came, and he was outside his yard doing some cleaning up. When he went to find the apple that he accidentally left, he noticed it was gone. He didn't put a lot of thought into it. He just thought an animal had taken it after all. It was just one apple he threw, figuring animals would come and eat it anyway. About a week later, he came home from work to find a dead fox on his porch. It looked like it had been strangled to death. Its eyes were literally popping out of its skull. He said the kill was fresh and wasn't sure if somebody was just trying to mess with him or what. Then he looked next to the fox, and the same now rotting apple with one bite taken out of it was sitting right next to the dead fox. He began freaking out, and was pretty sure that somebody was screwing with his head. He didn't call anyone though, instead, he waited to see if anything else would happen. Time went on, and nothing else happened. These events that I just told you about happened in September before it started to get chilly. So. Fast forward about six to nine months to the following spring, just as it was getting warm again. One evening, as he was having his girlfriend over for dinner in his house, his girlfriend started screaming that there was a huge, hairy man in the front lawn. He flew out and opened his door. There, standing about 50 feet away in the front yard, was this big black mass, as he described it. It was just standing there. His eyes tried to focus on it in the twilight of the evening, but his eyes pulled him to the object that this thing seemed to be holding in its hand. It looked to be a dead raccoon, a rather large one. He couldn't make out a face, definitive features, or anything else that would be specific to its description. But he said that he felt like it was staring right at him. This thing quickly darted behind a nearby tree once it realized he was looking at it. He said this creature seemed to be about 5 to 6 feet tall, if he had to guess, was really bulky and very shaggy and hairy. He knew instinctively that what he had seen outside of his house was a Sasquatch. Over the next couple of days, he thought more and more about it, and believed this creature was the thing that had left the dead fox on his porch along with the apple with one bite taken out of it the previous fall. He hasn't experienced any other activity around his house, or anything like that since initially sighting this in his front yard. Lots of kooky American hiking stories. Geez you guys have some weirdos in the woods. This one's slightly different and Australian. Hiking in the north of Australia where there is a very strong aboriginal presence, historically rock art and remnants and modern day, so can't disclose exact location. Let's just say it was in the top end of the Northern Territory. Bit of background, I was on a 22-day remote hike, one supply drop, no roads, no trails and very difficult terrain. Waterfalls, rainforest, savanna and treacherous sandstone country. On around day 18 I was heading up a creek, and it had been raining all afternoon, so the creek was rapidly swelling. At this point we were probably 150 kilometers to the nearest dirt road, much further than that to a settlement. The kind of country you really know very few white feet have ever trodden on, really humbling. Made camp on a nice sandy beach sandstone remember, and then went for a swim and a scout around camp mainly to see what rock art was in the area. I head up past my immediate waterfall swimming hole, and find a beautiful pool with a waterfall tumbling off a low undercut sandstone slab. Naturally I swam across to climb under the slab and get behind the waterfall. The crevice under the slab is perhaps one meter high, 
just high enough to scramble and sit under. Water flows underneath as well, but mainly over the top of the slab and in front of me. I'm lying back with a friend looking out onto the pool and water cascade when I notice something on the ceiling. It's rock art, under a waterfall with flowing water. Now this is quite unusual as people never really painted in places like this as one. It's a spooky cave in two. It's under a waterfall in an area that experiences that gets massive floods and likely to be damaged easily. Its location immediately makes me think it's something strange. And as I digest the artwork in front of me that increases. I'm looking at two odd skeletal things, long bony fingers, rib cages visible with outlines around them, each around one meter in diameter. I'm thinking there's something to do with sorcery or black magic art, and I'm being suitably creeped the F out, when it dawns on me what they probably are. These little bony figures are babies, the outline surrounding them is the amniotic sac. I'm looking at ancient paintings of dead babies or stillborns, under a waterfall, in the unbelievably remote and spooky wilderness. I decide to quickly side with custom, and get the F away from the obvious women's place, but not before I confirm by having quick look nearby. Indeed, to the side of the waterfall, in a more traditional place for rock art, I find birthing painting. Adult women and healthy children painted. I do have pictures of all this, but unfortunately I can't possibly post them due to cultural reasons sorry. I know that will piss some people off, but if you were from here you'd know how big a deal it is, and opens me up to all kinds of yucky legal stuff. I was mountain biking with my dad and a bunch of his friends, and we came to the last long downhill of the ride. I always let them go first, because I am way faster. They go down, and I wait for 5 minutes, then go for it. I get 200 yards from the end of the trail, and they are all on one side of the trail stopped in a line. At this point, there is no way I can stop fast enough, so I just get ready to jump anything in the way of the trail. My dad freaks the F out telling me to stop, stop, stop. As soon as I get within 20 feet, I see probably 30 big ass rattlesnakes crossing the trail. I immediately pull up as hard as I can, and bunny hop about 10 feet over all of them. Then I stopped, came back, and checked out the snakes along with my dad's blood pressure, made sure he was okay, then finished the ride. I'm telling you sickest bunny hop ever. When I was 12, I contracted hepatitis A. I was really ill, and for a month didn't say anything to anyone. I mean I was just a kid. Well, it progressed, and by the time they caught it, I was close to death. I was all yellow, my eyes, skin, everything, and in severe pain. I was admitted to the hospital. I didn't have parents. My sister had guardianship of me. She like dropped me off and I never saw her again. I was hospitalized for a month or more. I was on pain medications. My liver was inflamed, and it was impossible to eat. One night I awoke because I felt a presence. At the foot of my hospital bed were two little reptilian men. They were about four feet tall. Needless to say, I jumped out of my hospital bed, and tore out my ebbs, making the alarms go off at the nurse's desk. I crawled under my bed the nurses had to coax me out. Think of it, a 12-year-old child awakening to see lizard men in their room. As fast as it occurred they were just gone. I've not spoken of this in years. I only told two other people in my life. There was another time in about 2006 or 27, my husband fell asleep on the couch, so I left him and went upstairs to bed. Mind you, my room was dark really dark. I said my prayers and went to sleep. Sometime during the night, I awoke to this thing sitting on top of me. I started to wrestle with this thing, and let me tell you it was darker than my room. It was not sleep paralysis. I was awake. This thing was tangible. I could feel it. All of a sudden it was just gone, 
as the green lizard men. I jumped up and grabbed a cross I had hanging on my wall, laid back down prayed, and fell back to sleep. I don't care if people believe these things happened in fact, I've had lots of experiences with weird things. I've only been scared two times, the time the lizard men were in my room, and another when I awoke and felt a presence in our home, was turned facing the wall. And in my heart, I knew if I turned to look there was going to be something or someone there. Ignoring it, I fell back asleep. I am writing about a sighting I had on June 26, 2011, around 8 p.m. at Nelson Lake, Wisconsin. I was fishing from my canoe about 30 yards from the shore near Tanning Point when I noticed a whimpering sound. It was coming from the woods at the shoreline. It sounded like a dog whining, so I stopped what I was doing to watch the woods to see if anything appeared. After a few seconds, I saw a child scampering from the woods. I didn't get a very good look, but the child had very thick brown hair all over its body and was very small human toddler size. It quickly showed itself and then bolted back towards the woods. I sat there in shock. But within seconds I heard three distinct and angry grunts. I then saw a large ape-like head rise above the lower tree boughs. The eyes were barely visible, but I could tell that it didn't want me there. That was enough for me so I started to paddle towards the north shore when all of a sudden I heard a loud plop, and then splash from behind the boat. I turned around in time to see another rock heading in my direction. It was many yards from me but I got the message. I was shaking from the time I witnessed these beasts up until a few hours later when I was in my home office pondering what I had seen. I think it may have been Bigfoot. I googled Wisconsin Bigfoot and your blog came up. Was this a Bigfoot? I'm not an outdoorsman though I enjoy canoeing and fishing. Have there been other sightings in this area? Is there a danger? I appreciate your help. I am a state employee so I would prefer my identity remain confidential. Thank you. L. The following incident was in the same area. According to the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department, two deputies responded to an alleged Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, sighting on Highway 63 just south of Sealy on the evening of Jan. 3. Since then the sighting has been the topic of conversation in that small community, with multiple reported sightings being called into the Sawyer County Record Office since. Chief Deputy Tim Zeigel confirmed that two deputies responded to the call, only to find footprints and hair at the site. But, unless Bigfoot was wearing boots, Zeigel laughed, I think it's pretty much a prank. A lady called in and said, you probably think I'm nuts, but I'm not. I have not been drinking. She reported seeing a Bigfoot or someone dressed in an ape suit on Highway 63 near Stark Road, Zeigel said. We sent a couple officers up there, and what they found was a set of foot tracks going from the road to the timberline and back to the road, and they also found a long, black hair. He affirmed that there have been no sightings since then. But the story takes a curious turn from there. According to another reported sighting obtained by the record, a Wausau man, who wishes to remain unnamed, and his nephew were snowmobiling on a trail just southwest of Sealy, when they saw something unusual cross the trail. I don't know what I saw, but my nephew and I both saw something very real, he said. We only saw legs from the hips down as it was caught in the headlights of our snowmobiles. It stepped out of the woods, walking upright, and stepped across the trail right in front of my nephew, who was ahead of me 20-30 feet. The legs were long and covered with long dark hair, he continued. My first thought was it was a drunk walking through the woods after leaving the sawmill saloon, but that makes no sense. We were quite a ways west of the sawmill, and there is no trail or crossing anywhere near there for someone to be walking. After gunning their snowmobiles past, the two turned around to explore the area and find tracks. But they had not marked the spot with a landmark, 
and were unsuccessful at finding any sign when they returned to the area. We saw these legs for only a very brief moment, but again, it was very real, he added. Following up on the sighting, several possible theories have been revealed. Cindy Ferrero of the Sawmill Saloon said that one potential explanation is that something was roused when the managed portion of the Urenholt Memorial Forest south of Highway, who was cleaned up a few months ago. She said a friend who lives in the Seely Hills area has reported unusual behavior coming from her dogs lately. They seem to be agitated by something out of the ordinary. Back in 2013, I was bear hunting in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We were in Ontonagon County, northwest of Bruce's Crossing. My hunting stand was just north of FR 730 about 3 miles from US 45. The trail I was on was evenly spaced between FR 735 and FR 736. It was a small creek called Scranton Creek. It was almost dry at the time. I took the trail north about two miles and found a good place to set up a ground blind. I was hunting with a handgun, a 500 Smith and Wesson with a factory red dot scope on it. I've hunted all my life with handguns and have bagged deer and tons of small game. I'm also an NR a certified instructor and at the time was shooting competitively and teaching classes for concealed pistol licenses. I felt that I needed to give you some background on myself. I was totally confident in my ability to keep myself safe in the woods. I took up my stand just before daylight on the opening day of the first bear hunt. About an hour after the first light, I heard what I can only describe as a wood knock. It was north of me towards the Victoria Dam area. There was a series of knocks. First I heard three knocks evenly spaced and then two knocks that sounded closer to me. About 15 minutes later again, I heard three knocks that sounded like they came from the spot that I heard the two response knocks from, and again, I heard another two knocks. They were again closer to me. I thought to myself what the hell is making those knocking sounds. Again, about 15 minutes later, I heard three knocks from where the two responses had come from and then right behind me was a fast four to five knocks, and everything in the woods went quiet. It was so quiet I could hear the bugs flying around. I sat there wondering what the hell was going on, and who or what knew that I was there. I was in a camo pop-up blind, and I knew that whatever knew I was there had not seen me. About 15 minutes later I heard a whirling sound approaching me and a crash next to the blind. I got up went out and found a tree branch about 3 feet long and 3 or 4 inches in diameter had landed about a foot away from my blind. Now when I set up the blind I was cautious to make sure there were no trees with branches that could fall on me. There was a clear path through the trees to the trail about 6 feet wide, but it was a good 100 feet from my blind of the trail. No man that I know of could have thrown that piece of wood that far and with the speed it had flown. I radioed my hunting partner, and told him to come to my blind as soon as possible. When he got there I told him what had happened, and we both agreed that I should let whatever wanted the area have it, so we packed everything out and I went to another stand. I had set up on FR 733 where the North Country Trail crossed it. I ended up taking a 400 plus pound male bear the next day. It weighed 389 pounds dressed at the way station at Bruce's Crossing. I always wonder what threw that tree branch, and did all the wood knocking. The week I got back home, I was watching the BFRO guys on TV, and found out that they were about 40 miles south of where I was hunting looking for a Bigfoot, that the natives up there had reported to them, so I contacted them and told them my story, and was blown off by Cliff Berrickman. I felt that I had something to share, and they just weren't interested. The next year 2014, I took my girlfriend up there with me to show her around, and as we were coming back home, we were somewhere between Watersmeet and Iron River on US 2. 
As we drove past a blueberry bog that was on the north side of the road, at least a good 200 acres, we both saw a hair-covered animal stand up in the middle of the bog. It was at least four feet taller than the brush, and the brush was four feet tall or more itself. I looked at her and all she said was, keep going. I've hunted up there many times since, and have not had any more things happen, but sometimes you feel like you're being watched. My older brother and I were walking down the street, returning home from our grandmother's house in the dark. This was in Laport, Texas. There was a large, grassy lot next to our house, where our uncle lived in a mobile home at the back. It was a clear night and my brother was teaching me some of the constellations as we walked. We saw a gold-colored light come from the south and hover over us. I thought it was an airplane at first, but as it got closer, I realized it wasn't making any noise. I remember being afraid but my brother was excited. He said, oh wow, they are real. I grabbed his arm and tried to pull him to the house, panicking. He laughed and told me to calm down, that they wouldn't hurt us. He was my older brother so I trusted him to protect me. I stood behind him as the light came to the ground and landed in front of my uncle's house. It was a large black pyramid shape that was missing the top point. It had a couple of windows on the side, about halfway up. After it stopped moving, a slot opened up on the side facing us. The light that was under the craft was a greenish blue, and it hovered off the ground a foot or two, as the slot opened, and a beam came out. I guess unfolded out would be more accurate. The being looked almost human with a large, odd-shaped head, almond eyes the color of absolute darkness, and a small slit below where the nose slits were. It was very tall compared to my brother. He was about 14 years old so probably five and a half feet. The being was maybe six or seven feet. When it exited the craft, I heard a noise, like a soft murmuring of a bunch of voices. I was immediately soothed. I felt sleepy suddenly, but then the entity took my hand and my brother's hand. I don't remember it walking to us, but I remember how cold its hand was, and how rubbery it felt. I felt like I was floating, and it was taking us to its ship. We went inside and the slot closed behind us. Inside, it took us to a room where my brother was taken by another being, and I was led to a table. I screamed for my brother, but the being picked me up and sat me on the table, placed his fingers on my eyes, and I couldn't move or talk anymore. I was laid on the table and my clothes were taken off. I remember there being a soft pink light and three beings in the room with me, there was a straw-like tool hanging above me that one being put against my belly button. I remember searing pain below my belly button and smelling hot metal like copper. I tried to scream, but then the pain was gone. I looked toward one of the beings and saw my brother on the table near mine. He was looking at me with tears in his eyes. I could hear his voice, but his lips weren't moving. He told me he was sorry, he was wrong and that he loved me. I felt warm whereas before I was so cold. The being stopped moving as my brother, and I talked without moving our lips. I would think about him, and then hear his voice responding to me. We'd never been able to do that before. After a few minutes, my brother looked away from me, and I felt him slip away, mentally, and then he screamed like he was being murdered. I thought they were killing him. But I couldn't see anything because one of the beings moved between us and started looking in my ears with a bright light. I remember the gray color of those three fingered hands, the way they seemed to me to be rubber straws, the tips against my skin feeling terribly similar to a frog's flesh. They pried open my eyes when I tried to scrunch them shut and put a jelly substance in them. Then they stuck something up in my nose that hurt so bad I passed out. When I woke up, the ship was gone. My brother was lying in the ditch a few feet from me, and I thought he was dead. I heard my mother calling for me and my brother, so I sat up and called back to her. 
She ran to me from our yard to where my brother was lying, and when she saw him, she screamed. She picked him up and grabbed my hand, carrying him into the house. She asked me what happened as she laid him on the couch, but as I started to answer, my nose started bleeding. My brother came to as my mother wiped a cold rag over his face, and I got a washcloth for my nose. She kept asking why we were out till 3 in the morning. My brother told her about the craft and I did too, but she said she thought we were trying to make stuff up. She said it was obvious someone had beaten us up. We saw how bad our story upset her so we agreed, it was the local bully that beat us both up. After my mother went to bed when she thought we were asleep, my brother came into my room and we talked about it, agreeing to not talk about it again. The next day, he and I went to my uncle's yard. We looked for signs that something had been there, and we saw a square portion of the grass had been pressed down like a heavy weight had been on top of it. It's been 38 years now and only recently have my brother and I spoken of the incident. I still remember it like it was yesterday and so does he. This happened when I was 22 female, I'm now in my 30s. At the time, I was preparing applications for grad school, so after work each evening, I would go to the local university library and stay until closing, which was 11 pm. I took the subway to my neighborhood and decided to make a quick stop at the nearby 24-hour grocery store to get some things for a late night dinner. I bought my items and was back outside waiting at the crosswalk for the light to change so I could cross the street. There were at least two other people waiting at the crosswalk as well. I lived in a major metropolis and so there were almost always other people around at whatever time of night or day. Suddenly, a man comes running from out of nowhere, it seemed and stands next to me now also waiting at the crosswalk. He was middle-aged about 5 foot 7 170 centimeters, and had a slim build. I thought that maybe he just wanted to make sure he would make the light, and not miss the chance to cross. However as we are crossing the street I notice that he starts to make some odd movements with his legs. I don't really know how to describe it other than to say he was kind of tripping himself up and drastically slowing down, so that he went from walking in front of me to suddenly being directly behind me. To be honest, my first thought at the time was racism. I have a very petite and feminine build, looked very young, and was clutching library books in my arms, but I am also a black woman. I truly thought that he was scared to have me walk behind him. It never even entered my mind that I might be the one in danger. I simply noted his behavior laughed it off, and then forgot about him. On my walk home, I passed a small convenience store that I frequented for inexpensive fresh produce that was also open 24 hours. I decided to make a quick stop and get a few more items for dinner. I was in the store for maybe 5 minutes and had truly forgotten about that man from the crosswalk. Except, when I exited the store he was standing outside. I was so startled. It looked like he had been waiting for me. My heart started to pound in my chest, and I was going into survival mode. As soon as I passed him and continued walking home, he also started walking, following right behind me. I could hear his steps and sense him nearby. I needed to make sure that he was really following me so that I could plan my next move. I could see the entrance to the subway just ahead of me, I decided I would duck into the subway station to see if he followed me in but, more importantly, to ask for help from the ticket collector. Unfortunately, when I went into the station, the ticket collector was not in the booth. The station was completely empty. No commuters either. I spontaneously decided to hide against a wall to the left, where I could not be seen from the street entrance. 30 seconds later the man walked into the station so nonchalantly, he was almost skipping, as he headed right to the turnstile, as if it was his plan all along to take the train. However at the last minute, he looked behind him, and saw me standing there against the wall. 
As soon as he saw me he stopped, turned completely around and walked out of the station, no longer intending to go down into the subway. I knew I was undeniably in danger. I took out my phone and called my roommate let's call him Tim, praying he was home and would pick up. He did. I explained in a panic what was happening. Are you home? Can you come get me? I asked. Tim asked me if the man was still there. I carefully peeked around the wall to look out to the street. There was the man. He was standing, smoking and laughing with some guys. He was literally making friends as he waited for me outside the station. I told Tim, yes, the man is still there. A train must have arrived downstairs in the subway, because at that moment, there was suddenly a bunch of people coming through the turnstile and exiting the station. Tim and I agreed that I should leave the station in this crowd of people, stay on the phone with him, and he would meet me on the street essentially, we would walk towards each other. Our house was only a five minute walk away on the same street as the station. When I left the station I had to pass the man. He saw me in the crowd. I saw him throw down his cigarette, and then from behind me, I heard him say to the men he had been talking to, I have to go. He continued to follow me. I told Tim everything, since we remained on the phone. I tried to walk as quickly as I could, but there was snow and ice on the sidewalk. I don't know why I didn't alert any of the other people who had exited the subway station and were now walking with me on street. It was sort of this experience of feeling alone in a crowd, if you know what I mean. I knew the man was behind me, but was too scared to look back more than once to check. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw Tim, walking towards me on the sidewalk. We were both very young, but Tim 20 male is tall, over 6 feet, maybe 186 7 centimeters. I felt a wave of relief as he came to my side. He told me he took a knife from the kitchen to defend us in case. Our house was right ahead. We walked quickly inside and locked the door. With the lights off we looked out the window for the man, but he was nowhere in sight. A few months ago, some piece of shit lowlife broke into my apartment while I was at work. They rummaged through all my stuff, tearing apart my room. They took a bunch of shit, including a bunch of cash I stored away, my Xbox One, a 40-inch flat screen, and a bunch of food from my pantry. I came home that night to find the apartment had been trashed. It looked like a cyclone had moved through my bedroom. Of course I ended up calling the police, who came right over and investigated the apartment. The person had smashed the window in my bedroom and crawled in. I live on the ground floor, and so it would have been really easy for them. I gave the police a list of all the stuff that went missing along with the serial numbers for the electronics. They unfortunately didn't find any sort of fingerprints or anything they could use, and there were no cameras on that side of the building. I called the rental agency for my building about the window but they told me they couldn't send somebody until the next morning. That was probably the worst weekend of my entire life. The very thought that someone came into my space and decided they wanted my stuff sickens me. Thieves are the worst kinds of people. A couple months went by and there was no word on any of the stuff that got stolen. I expected that much. Police in my city are useless most of the time. I had already gotten a new TV, and so all I needed was a new Xbox. I did some thinking and decided that I wanted to buy one second hand, as I didn't want to spend another $400 on a new console. So I jumped on Craigslist and did some searching. Sure enough, I find a seller who wants to sell his for $250, long with all of his games and controllers. It was a pretty fantastic deal. The only issue was that the guy lived in the next town over. On the other hand, I was getting real tired of not playing video games, and so I gave in. I contacted the guy and inquired about the console. He told me his name was Sam. He seemed like a pretty cool guy, 
and was even willing to hold it for me if I came and got it that same day. I agreed. I jumped into my car 15 minutes later, and drove the 45 minutes to the next town. The town was very rural, and there were a lot of wooded areas. The house I was trying to find was way out there, next to some old train tracks. I pulled up to the house, which was off a dirt road. It was a real piece of shit, run down and overgrown. The old white paint was almost all chipped away, and the guy had a massive trash pile right in his front yard that was filled with a bunch of old junk, like TV sets and radios. I was unsure if I even had the right house, so I walked up to the door and hesitantly knocked. There was a short wait before I heard somebody shuffling on the other side of the door. It opened and revealed a very thin looking man with a buzz cut. I took notice that his clothes were filthy. He was wearing a tattered flannel shirt with ripped blue jeans. You Sam, I asked him. Yeah, you here for the Xbox? I nodded nervously with an MHM. He flashed me a smile and invited me inside. I had a bad feeling, like something wasn't right with this guy. His house was a disaster. Almost every piece of furniture was filled with junk and garbage, and it looked like his kitchen hadn't been cleaned in months. I knew right off the bat that he was a hoarder. I was worried about being the awkward one, but this guy was about as awkward as one could get. When I think about it now, I feel like he was probably on the spectrum, but I couldn't be too sure. There was also the smell, like something in his house was rotting away. Like something dead. He lead to into the hallway on the first floor, and stopped at a door that looked much newer than the others in the house. It's right down here, he said. He pushed the door open to reveal stairs leading into a dimly lit basement. Alarm started going off in my head, and I knew that there was something seriously wrong. I stood at the top of the stairs peering down. Sam stood behind me, almost as if he wanted to make sure I couldn't escape. Go on then. I said, stepping out of his way. You first. He replied. His awkward smile had gone to a cold gaze. When I looked towards the basement, the rotting smell had grown even stronger. When I listened closer, I could hear what sounded like millions of flies buzzing around down there. I turned and quickly pushed past him, sprinting down the hallway. He started to pursue, but then he stopped. I ran out the front door and back onto the dirt road, jumping into my car before speeding down the road as fast as my car could go. Before driving off, I caught the glimpse of his smiling face in the front window of the house. I made it home safe, where I realized that he had sent me a text message. The Craigslist ad disappeared after that, and I've since blocked his number. I thought about calling his town's local police, but after I calmed down, I realized there was probably not much they could do about it anyway. Days later, I started getting weird phone calls, usually hang-ups every time. This persisted for several weeks before I saw Sam's mugshot on the local news. I guess he lured another unlucky buyer to his house, and when the buyer also refused to go down to the basement, Sam assaulted him with a knife. Luckily, the buyer managed to fight him off and escape. The police were called, and were shocked at what they found upon searching his house. This sick, twisted F had been killing local dogs and piling them in his basement, where he then did weird experiments on the bodies. The very thought of it made me sick to my stomach, knowing what potentially could have happened to me had I not ran. I don't know what happened to Sam, but I sure as hell hope that he's spending his days in a padded cell somewhere. This is gonna be buried, but my geography teacher told us about the time he went hiking and discovered what was left of a base jumper, whose parachute didn't deploy properly. The only reason he even saw the body was when he realized that the place he'd sat down to eat lunch in was in fact stained red from finely spread blood splatter, and not just a cool looking rock. He still goes hiking in the same national park once a month.
After my second year of college, I wanted to move into an apartment. I had basically no real friends to choose from, so I decided to try Craigslist. I made an ad for housing wanted, described myself, put a picture because I found myself more drawn to messaging people I could actually see first, and my number for texting. I stated I was more interested in rooming with girls I am a girl. This one guy messages me saying his name is Oliver, and he has a nice apartment. The rent was really cheap too cheap, and he said I could have the first month free. I considered it for a while because at the time I had no other good prospects. I talked to him a bit, added him on Facebook to chat over Messenger, so it was a bit faster. I regretted that pretty quick because he started being super weird to me. He was a middle-aged looking guy. He talked about how he worked at a tattoo shop and could get me a job, prefacing it by saying that I could just sit and draw, and that it always helped to have a pretty girl drawing at a tattoo shop. At one point I complimented his dog, and he said, thanks, she's the only woman in my life besides my mom. At this point I obviously knew I wasn't going to move in with him, but for a bit it was making me laugh so I talked to him a bit longer. The conversation divulged into him essentially telling me he wanted me to be his girlfriend, I said no. And then he told me he'd pay me $3,000 to fly out to California with him to meet his family, so they would think he had a girlfriend. When I said no he kept begging me and telling me everyone thought he was a loser, and all I'd have to do was hold his hand. Deleted and blocked him on Facebook, then he began texting me asking me to send him a picture of my boobs. He said, please I never seen 19 year old boobs before. LOL, he continued badgering me despite me only replying once to say no, and that I had a boyfriend. Sent me a picture of his D by the end of it. Surprisingly, he apologized late that night, and never did message me again. Just a freaky freaky coincidence. Bought an orbital sander from a guy a few miles down. He was trying to move out of his place and cleaning out his garage. Tried to get me to buy a few other things. Ended up paying $25. His two kids were playing in the driveway. As I'm walking away, his six-year-old daughter looks me square in the eye and says, thank you. The next day I see in the news that she has died of carbon monoxide poisoning in her sleep. Her piece of shit father was running a generator in the basement, because he was behind on his bills. I was most likely one of the last people to ever talk to her. She haunted my dreams for quite a while. I have yet to use the sander. Should probably throw it away. This experience I am about to share sounds weird, it even sounds weird to me. I can't explain it, and I don't know if anyone else has ever had similar experiences, or if not maybe they should be warned. I'm a bit of a nerd. I love playing with computers, as in I taught myself how to code. I love doing puzzles, so using software and stuff was like figuring out a 3D puzzle. I'm also semi-good at fixing computers. I can't really explain it, but I'm just good at knowing what to do to fix any glitches etc. Okay, so now we have Web3, and I've been playing around to learn about that. I'm trying my best to keep this short and sweet, but that background info is pertinent. So, this is what happened. This was early last year in 2023 in spring, I believe in March or possibly earlier. Anyway, I had just woke up. I was just lounging, resting not in any hurry to get up. I was fully awake, when this round semi-globe, like a window, popped up in my wall, right above where the bed headboard is. On the other side of that wall is outside, the front of my house, it's not adjoining a room. Now in this little round window, it was an opening. I could see crystal clear. I could even hear everything. The inside was a church. I could see a piano, hear the music, and see the pews, inside was my old pastor, whose church I no longer attend. 
That's a long story too. He had on a long cream minister robe with a burgundy wine-colored collar that went around his neck and down the length of the front of the robe. He was scowling. He had his arms crossed, and he was also saying to Lil Nas X the rap singer. I know this sounds crazy, yet it's true and it happened, but he was saying to him, Lil Nas X, that I never listened to him, and it wasn't going to work. There was church music playing in the background. Lil Nas X was bending down and grinning at me, and had a stupid idiotic semi-evil sounding nervous laugh, and glazed looking eyes. He was wearing a dark colored suit, white shirt, and dark tie. He was ready to help me if I had indicated I wanted to go with them. I never said a word, I wasn't afraid, I was just really checking them out wondering what in the world was happening. I'm not a fan of Lil Nas X. I just happen to know who he is. All I really know is he started out singing country music and personally, I think he's foul but anyway. So maybe after a minute, I never said a word. And when Lil Nas X saw I wasn't trying to hop in the whole thing just kind of poofed, and was gone. No hole in the wall, no residue, no anything, just gone. This was totally different, and I'll never forget it. Now maybe a month or two later here is the next really wow moment. I am an admitted nerd, so as I have been checking out Web3, there is a site called Spatial. I'm not trying to advertise for them, but so anyone will better understand. This tripped me out. It is a Web3 site, where you can make an avatar and can create spaces, VR, audio, or use avatars to interact or showcase art or NFTs. Well, they have the option to add portals. These portals are shortcuts to other spaces. You can add them anywhere, to any other space destinations, and you can look and see into the connecting space. It is also a real-time shortcut that you can enter and be in the next space, and this is exactly like what I experienced. But in real life, before ever knowing about Spatial. So after I explored this site, and saw that and realized that is exactly what I saw, a real-life portal happened. An exact real-life portal. My husband laughed when I told him, but I told him what if I had gone? How would he explain my disappearance? All the cars were here, the dogs hadn't barked, and no trace would have been left. And they would have had to question him as no one else was here. So that made him think, because he really would not have had a clue, but he would be the only suspect. Again, I know this sounds crazy. I've had many strange experiences, and seen lots of paranormal or supernatural things. To me, this is the weirdest so far. I know that it was evil, they couldn't take me against my will. I would have had to be willing to go, I could sense that, and that wasn't happening. I'm still not afraid, just amazed and aware. Wondering if anyone else has experienced anything like this, and if not then just be aware. A few years ago I moved with my family right before I started college. Unfortunately it was kind of far from the university I had been accepted into. So I had been trying to find a place to rent close to my university. My dad helped me and showed me an ad on Craigslist. There was a nice looking house for rent, and it was close to my university. I decided to set up a meeting to go check out the place. I showed up in the afternoon and unfortunately I was alone. My dad said I was an adult and a big guy, so I shouldn't worry about meeting this person. This old guy greeted me, and then goes, you'll have to follow me to get to the house for rent. I was confused and said, your ad said this was the house for rent. Why do I have to go somewhere else? He says, this is my house. I'll take you to the one that's for rent. I'm a little concerned at this point, and followed him to his other place. I figured if things didn't look right, I'd just leave. We get there, and I notice the house looks bad, and it looked like people were in it. I didn't see any other cars around, so this seemed odd. He looks at me and says, don't you want to check it out? I said, I don't know. 
This isn't what was in your ad, and it looks like other people are there. He tells me that other people are checking it out, and I could join them. Something just felt weird about the whole thing, and I told him I wasn't interested anymore. This place looked in bad shape from the outside, and appeared to have people in the house. When he asked why I wasn't interested, I told him it was too far of a drive for school and work. He got mad at me and accused me of wasting his time. I said, I'm not the one advertising a house, and then telling the person it's not the one for rent. He began to glance nervously towards the house, and asked if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. I told him no and left. He never contacted me again thankfully. I'm not sure what his intentions were, but something just felt wrong. Maybe he was just trying to show me the house, but I didn't like that he lied about the house to begin with and that there were people inside the house. I'm not sure what was going on there, but I didn't really want to find out. I also didn't like how he kept looking at the house when he was asking if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. It seemed so bizarre how he went from being mad at me to getting kind of desperate for me to go inside. One night, about a year ago, I'm lying in my bed, and I don't even know that I'm sleeping, but I keep hearing the toilet flush. I keep hearing knocks on the door. I keep hearing voices, and then all of a sudden I say, angels, angels, please help me. Next thing I know, this seven foot tall being comes through my ceiling and lands by the bed next to me, and he's completely golden. A seven foot tall muscular, very muscular, blonde hair, and blue eyes. He had armor on, and a huge sword. Anyway, so I'm like looking at him and I'm like, oh my god, you're so beautiful. Well, a second or two later, my ears started ringing, and then also, the voice came into my head. I'd never heard somebody else's voice in my head, but it was a voice that wasn't coming through my ears. You know what I mean? It wasn't a thought, but it was in my head and he was speaking this language I'd never heard before. I remember I was trying to tune into it in my mind, trying to hear it better, and it just got louder and louder, like deafening, and then I woke up. I just shook my head, and then I woke up, and it was crazy because I didn't even know that I was asleep. I've been having a lot of dreams like that when I wake up, and I'm able to leave my body and walk around my house, but I can't leave my house yet. What is going on with me, and what kind of language did I hear? Did the Archangel Michael appear before me? Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.